I am going to very quickly just go through the process for today so everybody's clear on how we're going to operate, and then I will pass it on to our moderators uh, to begin the questions and answers. So uh, we're going to start off allowing each party, one candidate from each party, to have up to three minutes to share their platform with you. Um, Following that, uh, one of our moderators will be asking if there's any independents in the audience who would like to have uh, 30 seconds or so to share their platform. The moderators are going to take questions from the floor and mix in written questions that have been left at the door. So if anybody has taken a piece of paper to write a question and they want one of the moderators to read it out, uh, you need to make sure that it gets back to the front table. Otherwise, you'll be able to line up uh, behind the microphone that's on the left side of the room. Each uh, question will, will allow for up to three candidates to answer each question, and they'll have one and a half minutes uh, to respond. When there's 15 seconds left for the candidates, I will hold up this yellow piece of paper, and when your time is up, you'll get this. And uh, one of our moderators will, will move you along. Uh, we're gonna try and get a variety of questions, so the moderators, uh, may move people along if we're getting a lot of the same questions because we don't have a lot of time. We want to make sure that we get um, an opportunity for people to ask those questions that are important to them. Um, we'll be going until 11.30, maybe a couple of minutes past 11.30 since it's a little bit after 10. And from 11.30 till 12, uh, community members will have the opportunity to mix and mingle with candidates and ask any questions that they didn't have an opportunity to ask uh, previously. So with that, I am going to introduce our moderators. We are fortunate enough to have two local community members be our moderators today. We have Julian Phipps, who is the man standing on that side of the room. Uh, Julian Phipps is truly a driven person. Julian has a business background in commerce and marketing, and today has specialized and spent over 10 years in the financial industry. With a passion for the nonprofit side, he's also the co-founder of the annual Kitsilano Beach Kits Fest which served to continually upgrade the community and park facilities. Since successfully ex exiting a two-year-old technology online startup company last November, Julian is now currently the president of the Kitsilano Chamber of Commerce, where he's leading change, bringing fresh ideas, and creating new opportunities for individuals and businesses on Vancouver's west side throughout the Chamber of Commerce. And we have Ross Molster, who is sitting at the table. And uh, just so that you know, Jillian will be our, our roving moderator, and Ross will be our sitting moderator. Um, Ross has a 35-year background in small business and food justice, cooperatives, social and environmental activism, and sustainable, resilient community building. He is the founder and convener of Village Vancouver Transition Town Initiative, which helps neighbors to connect in community and create positive, tangible, local responses to issues such as climate change, peak oil, and increasing economic instability and inequity, such as growing more food together and promoting social enterprise. He's also a member of the Vancouver Food Policy Council and the SPEC, Car Free Vancouver, Now BC Co-op, and In the Pond boards, and serves on a number of neighborhood food network steering committees, including the Westside Food Collaborative. He lives in Kits with his wife, Laura Lee, and their cat, Attila. So uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Ross, and we will begin. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, we're going to have the candidates uh, very briefly introduce yourself. Uh, just, just your name and the party that you're affiliated with at this point. And then uh, we're going to designate uh, one candidate. You guys are going to choose that uh, from each party to uh, give a three minute uh, <coughs> talk on your party or if you're an independent, uh, what your, your platform is. And uh, I'm looking at my list and I see that some of the candidates have played musical chairs, so um, let's just start at the far left down there and um, introduce yourself. We'll go through the introductions and then we'll do three minutes from each party. Thank you. Good morning. Jim Lewis, Coalition of Progressive Electors. Very happy to be here this morning on the far left. <laughs> Ellen Woodsworth, City, City Council with COPE, and COPE is Coalition of Progressive Electors. I, I see that this is spelled slightly wrong here. 
Uh, Jeff, next with uh, Mayor Gregor Robertson, Commission Vancouver, and we're working on a joint ticket with COVID. Okay, I'm Chris Mason from Degrowth Vancouver. I'm Chris Shaw from Degrowth Vancouver, and we're further to the left than Tim, even though we're sitting here. <laughs> Adrian Carr, Green Party of Vancouver, right in the middle. <laughs> My name is Brandon Helton. I am the mayoral candidate uh, running against Suzanne Anton and Gregor Robertson. And I'm with a new group or new party in Vancouver called Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver. But we actually have a history that some of you may know that goes back uh, several years already with the roots right in the grassroots in the neighborhoods of Vancouver. Ken Charco, running with Susan Anton and the rest of the MKA team. I uh, look forward as well to serving you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now each party is going to have an, an independent will have a chance to uh, give three minutes on their party platform. And so I'm with the Coalition of Progressive Electors, a 40-year-old party that's fought for a long time for social justice, economic equality, and environmental sustainability. And over this past three years on council, I've fought very hard for affordable housing and to support homeless people into shelters 24 hours, seven days a week, 30, 365 days a year. I took the lead on council to fight the casino fight. I've stood up for artists. I've stood up for public transit and getting public transit all the way to UBC. Childcare has been a priority of this council. Many of the things that we've done, we've done unanimously because we knew that there was a progressive agenda that had to be fought for. I stood up and opposed spot rezonings in neighborhoods. I said we first need area plans that are the, what the community wants and needs. It provides the kind of density that community wants. And I felt that the developers were coming in and providing huge towers that didn't provide the community amenities needed in the neighborhoods and in fact were eroding heritage and a real affordability in the community amenities that we needed in those communities. We stand up for a living wage and a fair wage for all. I worked hard to get the Canadian Coalition of Municipalities Against Racism and Discrimination approved at Council and one of the most exciting things that we think we've done in that area is to set up a three-year project called Citizen U, training 2,000 young people in a, to fight racism and discrimination. We also set up the six community advisory uh, bodies that the previous council has membered. So we set up a women's advisory committee for the first time, an LGBTQ co community for the first time, the bicycle community, se seniors, sorry, advisory committee, seniors advisory committee, disability advisory committee, multicultural advisory committee, and con continues with the merits task force on immigration. These are all critical things. We worked very hard on setting up the greenest city agenda. Councillor Cadman and Councillor Andrea Reimer and the mayor took the lead on this one for council. And now you can look at our website and take a look at the greenest city agenda and how it will play out in the next few years to make Vancouver the greenest city by 2020. Vancouver wants to make Vancouver a city for everyone. And we're very concerned that this, this is not happening. This is becoming a city for the wealthy. Seniors, immigrants, and young people are being driven out of the city, and that we have to develop policy, actions, and funding to make sure that there's a balance so that we can all enjoy the, all the wealth that's created in the city. These are critical issues for COPE. We've been here for 40 years. You can take a look at our website, www.cope.bc.ca, and look at our record. I hope that you will vote for us in the upcoming election. We're supporting Mayor Greg Robertson in vision because we feel that we don't want to return to the days of the MPA where the wealthy are the ones that run the city. Okay, thank you, Ellen. Uh, Jeff, if I guess you'll be speaking on behalf of Vision. Yeah, thanks very much, Ross. And thanks to the organizers for uh, putting together this meeting and all of you for coming out so early on a Saturday morning. I think there are terrific base hits there, though, for anyone who's still hungry. Uh, my name is Jeff Max, and I'm uh, running for re-election to council with Mayor Gregor Robertson and the Vision Vancouver team, and we're supporting the COPE uh, team as well, because we feel that although we've done a great deal in the last three years, which we feel very positive about, we think there's a lot more that needs to be done. The two key issues that we're focusing on are homelessness and housing, and then, as Ellen has said, the green city and uh, transportation is a critical factor in that, in that uh, whole issue. So on the homelessness and housing front, 
You're aware that uh, Mayor Robertson spearheaded the fight to bring in winter shelters and shelters year-round. As a result of that, street homelessness is down by 82%. That innovation is very, very important because it uh, allows people to settle down for a little while and find some stability while they move to more permanent housing. And the provincial government is finally delivering some of those housing units here in Vancouver. But in our second term, we really want to continue the job and achieve the elimination of street homelessness. Make sure that there is more housing brought on by the province so that uh, people have a decent place to live. And then go further and start to work on that part of the housing spectrum that the private sector has not found a way to serve because of our land prices. Historically, we've had housing co-ops, we've had medium cost housing. We need a new form of market, mar uh, modest market housing or some more affordable band in there for middle income earners so that they can live closer to the jobs and, and help us support a more sustainable city. That's a really critical question coming up. It hasn't been debated much in this election, but one that we really have to come to grips with. The second one that uh, I really want to speak about briefly is, is transportation, our Greenest City Action Program. Ellen's told you some of the points there, but being in the Greenest City is not uh, just an advertising or branding proposition. It's, in our view, the crucial way that our city becomes viable and remains uh, sustainable into the future. One of the key things that you're going to start to see as we roll it out is an implementation of citywide composting. I think we've been behind on that. Uh, the pilot program is being done right now in a couple of single family districts to work out the kinks and see, but other cities are doing it, including in the lower mainland. We really want to see maximum waste diversion so that waste is used as a resource instead of put into a landfill. I think our council was the first in the lower mainland to uh, make a systematic challenge to the expansion of oil tanker traffic. So all the way down the line, right through to the commitment to try to create green jobs, to encourage more uh, long-term investment by the private sector in uh, green technology are all part of the package. So on those two fronts, uh, we're really determined to go forward if we get your support in the second term. I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, for kids, part of the question is community planning and management. We've tried to support community plans here. I'm interested to walk past the place on 7th. And I'd be interested to talk a little bit about that rezoning as the, as the day unfolds because it was a very important uh, decision and your community was very involved in that. So thanks for your time. <coughs> Great, thank you, Jeff. Next we'll have uh, Chris from uh, Degrowth. Hi, my name is Chris Shaw. I'm running for Degrowth Vancouver. And we really stand on three basic principles. The first is having that and beginning that, that rational discussion about lifting growth. I think innately we all know we have to do that and it's how we do it and how we begin to, to look at that process that's going to be important. We believe in true sustainability, not greenwash, not what the other parties are talking about, about massaging the problem, but actually beginning to really address the problems that we're going to face as we expand our ecological footprint and how we don't do that. But I really want to focus today on that third part of our platform, which is grassroots democracy, because I don't think we have it. And I think you cannot have those other things. You cannot have rational discussions about the limits to growth. You cannot really have sustainability unless communities themselves are not only part of the, de the democratic process, but they are the democratic process. So what we have now in the city, and, and, and elsewhere of course, is we have a form of pseudo-democracy. Here in Vancouver, you show up at the polls every three years, and the main developer parties, and I'm gonna say that they are the developer parties, and, and, and NPA, and Vision, because all you have to do is look at their financing, find out who's, who's pulling their strings. They want you to show up once for every three years, and that's all you get to do. That's your democratic process. They may let you consult with them, but then you get comments such as we heard the mayor make, calling people hacks because they disagree. That's, that, that's not real democracy. That's, that's a consultation form that's easily ignored. And then they'll pass you out a sample ballot like that because some parties think you're too stupid to actually make up your own minds and vote for yourselves. Real democracy is something that really, it, it, it looks to me like this button that you guys have here. It says, I love my hood. Well, you not only should love your hood, you should take control of your hood. This is yours, you live here. And if you really wanna see the contrast to what uh, a false democracy, such as we, what we practice every three years in the city looks like, go down to, to Occupy Vancouver and see what real democracy looks like. It's messy, it's chaotic, but people, in, in some, many cases for the first time in their lives, are talking about the issues that face them and trying to make their own decisions. It, 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 is, it is hard to look at the first time you see it. It's not Robert's Rules of Orders. It operates under a different system. But people are engaged. And what you see emerging down there is almost like a parallel system of government, a parallel system of democracy where people are actually engaged and trying to make the decisions about how, how they're going to address homelessness. So in the site, the, 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 the Occupy Vancouver site, as, again, as, as odd as it looks to some people, there is basic medical services, there are basic social services, there is basic shelter, 
There's basic food services for people who cannot access them easily in the city. That's what really democracy is going to look like, and that's the way I think we need to be, be, be moving forward. We need to be pushing the power out to communities, whatever those communities may be, so that you make the choices that move upward to City Hall, not downwards from City Hall like a cookie cutter coming down and telling you what to do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, now Adrian from the Green Party. Great. Hi, everyone. First of all, thank you for the mug. This is beautiful. The first gift we've had at all candidates meeting, and it's green on the inside. <laughs> Uh, I am Adrian Carr. I'm running for council for the Green Party of Vancouver. We have a slate of three. There's just one of us for council, myself, Stuart McKinnon for re-election to Parks Board, and Louise Boutin for School Board. Um, I am so delighted to be here because in so many ways, both this election and this particular debate feel so much to me like coming home. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm one of the co-founders of the Green Party, the Green Party of British Columbia, which was the first in all of North America, and the Green Party of Vancouver. So we founded that in 84 and, and the Green Party of BC in 83. In a house not too many blocks from here, um, my husband and I, first home was at 2227 Trafalgar. And uh, so this is, this is the heart of, of where uh, the movement started that has just led to the election of Elizabeth May. It feels like coming home here in this election too, because what many people don't know about me is my background is actually in urban geography. I did my master's degree at UBC, uh, studying with Walter Hardwick and David Lay. Um, so my grounding was in fact in this city's politics um, and development. My master's thesis was on Kitsilano. And uh, the Kitsilano Chamber of Commerce reps here probably know, um, I actually wrote about the Kitsilano Chamber of Commerce and the Residents Association at that time, and the way in which they built community spirit here and stopped development they didn't want in this neighborhood. In the 50s, they stopped high-rise development from going all the way up 4th Avenue. Um, I think those issues are the same issues uh, that we're facing today. The big question in this election is, how do we accommodate growth in this city without compromising the quality of life and the quality of our neighborhoods. And we're not doing it as, as good as we could right now, and that's why I would like to be elected, to help get us on a path where, in fact, the growth that we do accommodate is done within the construct of community plans in which people have been involved and their wishes in those plans respected so that instead of one-off decisions negotiated with developers, which is not good public policy, you deal with real solid plans that put at their heart and core neighbors' wishes about what their neighborhood wants to look at. Those are the key things to me. What you can expect of me in my election is that number one, I will, I will be collaborative. I have taken on many tough issues in my life and I know you get through them by listening to every voice on that issue and pulling together solutions. I will be collaborative at the council table working with whoever you choose to elect, because it should be more of a team rather than individual parties vying with each other at that table. And what you can expect in all the decisions I make is that I will put public interest first. I will put what is good, what is best for you and your quality of life and what will be better for our children in the future. On November 19th, when you see your council ballot, you'll have a number of people. Oh, I am? I didn't see this. Where is she? Oh, wow. <laughs> Oh, you need to come. I don't have my glasses on. You need to come forward now. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I'll, on November 19th, you can mark one X for me, Adrian Carr, and you still have nine other choices. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Adrian. Okay, Sandy. Hi, I'm Sandy Garasino, independent uh, candidate for city council. You can learn more about me at votesandy.ca. And uh, just remember no casino, Garasino. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, probably most of you know me best uh, from the casino fight that we had earlier this spring where a, a team of us, uh, neighborhood associations, the arts, the nonprofits, and charities uh, uh, fought the expansion of the casino at BC Place Stadium. I'll just tell you a little bit more about my background so you get a little bit of a, a sense. Uh, I was born in Vancouver but grew up in Alberta and I came back here uh, at the age of 17 and at, at 17 I was on my own and had to put myself through university through two degrees and uh, through law school. Um, I became a prosecutor, a Crown Prosecutor. I actually worked with Suzanne Anton. We job shared at the Crown Council office and I was uh, specializing. I also had a specialization in gangs, organized crime. 
and also youth. So I saw quite a range of diversity. Then my father and I reunited in that time, and, and after that, I took over his businesses after he passed away with my brother. We ran uh, three Metro Vancouver uh, taxi companies. We had over 200 employees. Um, and from there, I have had business interests. I've been a mom at home. I've, I've had interests in Asia. I, I do business in Asia. I am there in India once or twice a year. I'm in Singapore, in Hong Kong. So I see a great deal of what's happening in the global, the global context of, that is actually affecting us here in Vancouver. I see it from outside as well. I'm on the SFU India Advisory Council and I'm a supporter of the UBC Institute for Asian Research. Um, the issues that most uh, concern me are community consultation. We really saw that at the, uh, in the, during the casino fight. And, and you know, I really want to give credit to uh, Ellen Woodsworth and her great work. And Jeff Meg's door was uh, always open to us and he was, he was really receptive and, and helpful through the process. But the process itself was extremely cumbersome and difficult. The issue that most concerns me, however, is the issue around housing affordability. We do have the issue of homelessness, but we are now seeing the housing affordability crisis reach up into uh, the broader class, what in Hong Kong is called the sandwich class, uh, the people who are above subsistence and, and below wealth. We have a major crisis and we really have to focus on that and the reasons for it and we have to determine that we are going to solve that because that is the future of this city. We are losing our, we're losing our young people, we're losing our future and we're stressing our seniors. Thank you. Great, thank you Sandy. And I guess, Randy, you'll be representing SFP. All right, uh, my name again is Randy Helton and I speak for a few minutes here. With, I'm with Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver. Our website is nsvancouver.ca. I believe that this is the most important election of our entire generation. Uh, the things that I've seen in the last few years have convinced me that there are serious problems at City Hall, and this is our last chance to fix them. Things have been put in place the last few years that will determine the, the next several decades in the Lower Mainland. This is a graph that shows the, develop, the contributions to the major political parties in the last election, and this year is likely to be the same. The two tallest ones are NPA and Vision Vancouver, about two and a half million dollars. Then Cope is way down there, and Green is very low. Um, these, if you think about the saying, follow the money, that is very true. I am one of the people the mayor uh, used profanity towards in July last year. I've been to city council many times, and many people involved in the Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver Network have spent uh, many hours. I, I estimate that tens of, tens, oh, tens of thousands of hours of citizens' time has been spent dealing with City Hall over the last several years. That's under the NPA and by Envision as well. In fact, if they were to make a coalition, they would be better to make a coalition with each other because their policies are very similar and with some of the most critical issues. Um, we believe, on our website, you can see many of our principles that we are proposing to follow. Uh, we're very much neighborhood-based, uh, and in our name, that's the N. S is for sustainability, and V is for policies that really fit Vancouver. But we believe that many of the policies implemented by the NPA, including eco density, uh, and then impl implemented by Vision Vancouver with even greater strength, are causing the problems of housing affordability. We know for a fact that housing developments that have been destroyed, that, that were home for over 800 people, Little Mountain, uh, could have continued to serve people for a long time before being destroyed. That's just a flat piece of ground right now with a few people living on it. Uh, Vision, in even just the past few weeks, has approved the construction of high-end market-priced condominiums, uh, Boundary and Kingsway, with, and they waived the requirement to include uh, rental housing. Uh, they, in many of their policies, we believe, are part of the problem. The source of funding, much of which go, comes from the United States, in fact, 
is, is affecting all of the decisions that happen at City Council to the detriment of our entire society. It, it, deals, it uh, affects transportation policy, housing policy, and many, many other things. This is the time we need some real change, and we recommend that you vote. We've got five people from NSV, and we've also recommended some others that we can work with, uh, many of who are at this table right now. Um, and I just just finished that. Uh, from Ryan, our group. Okay. If you could just stand up, this is the other other of our group here: Marie Kirchen, Wally, or, or Marie Kirchen, and Terry. <coughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Randy. And now Ken's going to represent MPA. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ken Charco. I'm running with the NPA. Uh, I want to start off just telling you a little bit about the NPA. Uh, uh, how, how the MPA works. The MPA is basically made up of uh, 22 separate campaigns. You have the main campaign, which is uh, the mayor's campaign, and then you have the individual campaigns. Uh, I want to be clear here is that uh, as related to donations to the NPA, the grants that were shown in that, I've received uh, no money from any developers on my personal campaign. I've never met, uh, as far as I know, or been introduced to anyone that is a developer. I've never accepted a check from anyone that is a developer, um, save and except one that, I, that I've known for a, for a long time. And uh, that, at this time, is the only one that I am going to accept. So uh, I need to, I want to get that out there. Secondly, I want to tell you some stuff about me. My name is Ken Charco. I'm uh, the owner of the uh, Dunbar Theatre, um, small business guy. I've uh, been operating it for at least the last 12 to 14 years. And that's part of the reason that I got involved in politics. I was elected by the independent theaters in the city as well as the province, which includes the Hollywood, unfortunately it's gone, the Ridge, the Varsity, uh, Fifth Ave Theater, and the Rio, and all of the theaters across the province to represent them on the Motion Picture Theater Association Board, which is uh, encompassing the Cineplex, the Landmark, all the major chains, as well as the uh, to deal with business and industry related issues. Over the last five to seven years, uh, I've seen a number of the small businesses, especially the theaters, run into uh, difficulty operating in this theater, most notably recently the Hollywood. Uh, some of you know the owners of the Hollywood, Dave and Vince, and they're supporters of myself, and I've been supporters of them. So uh, I decided to get involved in that, and, uh, and that's what I've done, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And part of the reason that they're having difficulties with uh, these type of businesses that I think everyone here supports, and, and I would suggest most people on the board here suggest support, those arts and cultural type of businesses, those small businesses that you need to have in your community, to have the community that you want. Uh, it was many a time in this community that I would go and visit the Hollywood Theater and hundreds and hundreds of people would come to there and save and accept uh, the ability to work within the, the municipal taxational levels, they would have thoroughly quite well. And uh, those are the reasons that I'm getting, uh, wanting to get involved. So I look at that not only from a small business perspective, but actually as an individual, and forward that on to affordability, on what we can be able to do as people here, as well as politicians. And we gotta look at all, all answers. And one of the things that I wanna be able to do is to bring affordability back to Vancouver for small businesses and for small individuals getting into the housing market. Thank you very much. I also wanna say Bill McCurry was scheduled to be here. He's just had a conflict and asked me to, to send on his uh, apologies. Thank you very much for coming today. Great, thank you, Ken. So, can I see a show of hands of how many other candidates we have in the audience? Okay, so what we would like you to do, we'd like to offer each of you 30 seconds to say a little bit about yourself. Uh, we have a microphone over here, so if you'd like to uh, step up to the microphone, and we can also uh, bring in the microphone if that's easier. Hi, my name is Marie Kirchum, and I'm with NSV, Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver. Um, we really want to make some change. We're very concerned about what's going on at City Hall. Uh, so I urge you to get out there and vote and be part of the change. It's critical at this point. I think Randy has outlined our key points. I have been the registrar of the BC College of Teachers, and I know what it means for 17 years I know what it means to work in the public interest and not for special interest groups. Thank you. You're allowed to speak for 30 seconds. Yeah, any other candidates in the audience? Sorry, I'm here to speak. Uh, good, I'm Terry there. I 
Terry Martin. Hi, my name is Terry Martin. I'm running with Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver. Most of our candidates and all of the people that are on our steering committee are from neighborhood groups all over the city. We've been working uh, not with City Hall, but being ignored by City Hall and neighborhoods all over Vancouver in the last six years. And, uh, and we want to change that. We want, we want to bring real change. I really encourage all of you to vote not on what the NPA and vision says, vote on their records. When in the last six years, when they talk about creating affordability, it's, it's bogus because affordability has gotten so much worse. Their policies are making everything rise, rents, housing prices. Uh, you need to really look at what they've said compared to what they've done. What we say we'll do, we will do. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Well, I have, I have a lot of misinformation. So anyway, my name is Eleanor Hadley. I'm an independent, and I'm running for Parksport. I have spent the last 40, 50 years going to Parksport meetings and city hall meetings and trying to protect Sandy Park and the city from develop developers and um, commercialization, which is going on in Stanley Park, as you know, right this year, Stanley Park, um, Park Board gave the aquarium the right to build four buildings, one seven stories high and two new well pools in the center of um, uh, our Stanley Park. And in Bay, they are building a luxury restaurant right in the middle. We're, we're asking uh, candidates to. Mr. Moderator, uh, what I am saying is very important. To yes, I know. We have very limited time, so we're asking uh, candidates on the floor to limit their comments to 30 seconds, please. And I have some pamphlets here if anybody wants to see them. And I think the moderator is uh, not fair if he doesn't let me finish at least one sentence. Thank you very much. I have worked very hard. I have gone to all the meetings to spread the word, so to speak. So I have a pamphlet here for anybody that wants it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So. The format that we're now going to... Okay, oh yeah, one more, I'm sorry. Uh, 30 seconds, my name is Pre, um, uh, Pre Short. I'm running for uh, Parksport Independent Candidate. Please check out my bio and platform at www.preforparks.com. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. Okay, so the format, we have approximately an hour for candidates to answer questions, and I'd like to invite anyone who has a question uh, from the floor to line up at the microphone. We're going to use a, uh, a rotation of questions from the floor, and then I have some written questions here that were submitted. Okay. Anybody has a question that can bring the microphone and, around? And uh, the format that we're going to use is we're going to use a... a uh, we're going to have up to three candidates answer each question. If uh, there's a burning desire for maybe a fourth candidate, we might entertain that. You can address uh, your questions to all candidates or to specific candidates, and we're going to use a rotating format. So each candidate will have a uh, chance to answer uh, a, a couple of questions. We're going to attempt to get about 10 or 11 questions in, in the time that we have. So if you'd like to uh, line up at the microphone, and uh, do we have anybody out there? Yep. And a show of hands as well. I can come around and take your question with this roving microphone. So just raise your hand, and we'll, I'll, I'll notice you, and I'll come by. Um, good morning. Steve McFarland, social studies teacher at Solano Secondary. And I take care of the traffic circle over there at Kent Design. Perhaps you've walked by that. Um, my issue is the Arbutus Rail Corridor. And I wonder if we can have a briefly summarize your position and vision for the Arbutus Rail Corridor. Okay, so we're going to, for this first question, we're going to have um, Tim and Jeff and uh, Chris Shaw uh, answer in that order. All right. 
Well, that's a very underutilized resource, and that's very unfortunate. We need to put that resource to use. Many, many years ago, it was used in a very wise way for at-grade LRT at a very, very low-cost, cost-effective way. It moved people from Vancouver to Richmond. And I still believe that that may be an option. I use the word may because in the meantime, it sits dormant. At the very least, it should be used for things like community gardening, a bicycle route, and so on. We need to look at that asset. It is an asset. Get community input and put that asset to work. It sits there right now dormant and it shouldn't be sitting there dormant. So I, I, I'd look to you for any other ideas in addition to community gardening and a bicycle route while we looked at very low cost, at grade, old fashioned, I'm old fashioned, old fashioned LRT, a tram that would move people at a very cost effective way. And the, the bed's already there, the rail's already there, let's do it. Yeah, I don't disagree with anything Tim said, but people should, should realize that uh, CP Rail still owns it. They tried to take the entire thing for development. The Vancouver Area Cycling Coalition has proposed a bike route there, and the city's in uh, talks with CPR. It would be at lead to a balanced agreement that would keep it for transportation, the options Tim has pointed to remaining open, make it available for cycling, and, and put some of the land that's along there that's not needed for either purpose back into discussion for a city asset that could be used for other things. But in the short haul, certainly, I like the VACC's idea of a bike route there. It would be a terrific connector, and it's all a beautiful, smooth grade. Well, a little bit of a history lesson on this one. If you remember back before the Olympics, uh, the Arbutus Corridor was considered as one of the routes for building, building the, the route line. And it got, got shut down, and they went instead to Canby. And we said at the time, the, uh, the opposition to the Olympics, and Adrian was part of that in those days, we said at the time that that was all a development scheme. That they were pushing it down Canby because they were trying to hyper-develop the Canby Corridor. Which, guess what, it turns out to be true. That turns out to be exactly what they're doing down the Canby Corridor. So do we need more uh, uh, north-south connectors? Yes, we do. And the, and the uh, Arbutus or a rail line would be certainly uh, well-suited to do that purpose. Uh, and, and of course, we need mass transit all over the place. But what we need is a rational plan planning process that's not driven by developer interests, that's not driven by special interests, such as the Olympics, to do, do certain things according to their timeline and according to, our, unfortunately, our budget. And so the, the, the notion that we could open this up and do many things with it, I think, is a very good idea. And, and it should have been done a long time ago. It should have been the main thing that we considered back in 2003 when we first locked ourselves into that Olympic budget. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Adrian, Sandy, and Elizabeth. And uh, this is one of the written questions. Are you aware that many streets and buildings are not friendly to people who have a disability? What thoughts do you have for making improvements? Well, first of all, sidewalk repair. Um, it's absolutely atrocious. I was just out campusing the other day, uh, yesterday, on, uh, on Davy Street, where there were incredible bumps right near an area where there were a lot of seniors in residence um, who have walkers and wheelchairs, and they cannot negotiate um, the, the sidewalks themselves, um, let alone getting off the sidewalk onto the streets. We need to be a city that's user-friendly for everyone. Um, and a progressive city would put that money into making sure it's accessible for those <coughs> who need, by virtue of any disability or age, um, or you know, young mothers with uh, young young fathers with baby carriage, that they can get off and on the streets easily, and the sidewalks are safe. Um, so I think that's a that's a priority. And what I need to say as well is that basic infrastructure that makes our communities safe and that that leads to better quality of life. And that includes not just sidewalk repair, but road repair for bicyclists, for example, um, and includes our community infrastructure, our community centers, our pools, including outdoor pools. These need to be priorities in our budget. I don't have a policy on this, but I, but I have lived in a, in a uh, disabled, in, in a completely accessible building, and it's actually quite remarkable how pleasant it is to live in a building like that. And I would be very interested in seeing uh, uh, 
a lot of initiatives that drive this sort of thing uh, much more, especially in, in new buildings as they're created. I agree with Adrian about the sidewalks. My father-in-law had a terrible tumble on a, on a sidewalk in exactly this kind of situation. So all of these things are things that I'm very sensitive to. I'm very sensitive to senior issues and issues surrounding um, the disabled. And uh, the one thing that I would say, certainly about new construction, is that uh, my understanding from talking to people in development is that we are building buildings for a marketplace that is very much about investment properties and just reselling into the market rather than, the, the, than designs that meet the needs of human beings that live in them. Thanks. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, you can. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I missed part of that question. Could you repeat it, please? Yes. Are you aware that many streets and buildings are not friendly to people who have a disability? Uh, what thoughts do you have for making improvements? I think that uh, accessibility, not just for buildings, but also for the city at large, is is, is very important and, and it actually works for everyone, the, both the young and the old and everyone in between. And I think we need to um, have more of that into consideration about how, how we design uh, our buildings and, and also our improvements. But I think that these issues need to be uh, directed from the grassroots and, and neighborhood-based planning processes. and. Uh, uh, that is a, a, a main premise for Neighbourhoods for Sustainable Vancouver, and I think that every neighbourhood should have a, a neighbourhood planning process that allows those kind of issues to be brought forward. And also, we need to put money into basic maintenance to make sure that the sidewalks are, in fact, kept at a, at a good, um, in good shape so that if there are tree roots that those are dealt with so you don't have breaks in, in, in the sidewalks. My, my mother, who was elderly, had a fall on, on just such a, a, a crack and that uh, actually ended her up in the hospital, so it's very important. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Hello. Can I something to do? Sure. I think it's very clear that we need professional advisory committees. We need to listen to the organizations in the community, and that's why we established the Bicycle Advisory Committee, the Disability Advisory Committee, the Seniors Advisory Committee, because we knew there was we needed the help of the community. And the people who volunteered for these communities are experts. And I asked you to talk, take a look at the website. The, on the website should be the Disability Advisory Committees presentation to council on the transit plan. And they have it's comprehensive, it's several pages long. I don't want to go into all of it, but one of the key things they said is that one third of the bus stops don't have ramps. So this affects seniors, it affects the disability community, and affects uh, parents who are pushing buggies. So I, I, don't, I can't go into it all, but they've been doing some outstanding work, and they continue to come before council and make recommendations, and they work with staff on designing a, an able, friendly city. And I'm sorry that Tim can't speak because he's been one of the leads on this, but uh, I just grabbed the mic. Um, sorry, okay. can, can I have you as first on the next question? I'm just going to answer this question as well as I can because it is important. Well, I'd like to get us through all the questions because we have four people answer this one. So, okay. I, if you're going to give you limited to three people, you cannot budget anyone. Yeah, and I've, I've indicated that I will entertain a fourth, but I don't want to get to a fifth at this time because we've got a lot of uh, Questions together. Okay, so, can I get 30 seconds? No, no, you're going to be first on the, on the next question. Okay. We have another question from the floor here, also. Okay, go ahead. Ken, you'll be really happy that you get to answer this question. So, okay. <laughs> um, I'm really concerned about the small businesses that are dropping like flies on the west side and all of the franchises going in, especially along 4th Avenue. 
Um, we don't need another cell phone shop or a Lululemon look-alike or a, a baby store. Um, you know, all the little mom and pop shops and small businesses um, make our community livable and walkable, which is, I think, one of the goals of, of Greenest City. Um, so I'm really concerned about that. I, I struggled a lot with it. I don't know what the answer is. I'm hoping uh, some of you have an answer. I also think putting in SkyTrain or LRT along Broadway is actually going to make the situation worse. Okay, thank you, Frank. This, this question is for Ken, and then uh, Chris Mason and Alan. All right, uh, thank you, thank you for, for your call. I too fundamentally believe that a community that I want to be part of isn't a community strictly made up of Starbucks, McDonald's, and Tim Hortons. I believe that a community that makes this community special, although it's not my primary community, the Dunbar uh, is where I spend a lot of my time because that's where, where my work is, but when I walk down there, I'm amazed at how much, uh, just walking into a store which happens to be a, a discount bookstore, so they sell books for a quarter, I go in there to take a look and I end up being in there an hour. I meet my neighbors more than I do when I'm downtown. We need to be able to do that. So when we take a look at the tax system that we have within the municipal uh, system, we got to figure a way of not only doing a, a residential to, um, to commercial tax shift, but we also got to be uh, work with the provincial government and come up with a way that we can do uh, a, a tax shift that targets those small independent businesses more directly and quicker. And more importantly than that, is that we give them certainty and some degree of planning to how things are going to be happening. The biggest problem that happened with the Canopy Corridor that affected the small business is, is not so much what happened or how it happened, but at the time frame it happened without the consultation. If they'd had time to be able to plan it within their leases, within their budgets, they would have been able to do that. And that's what I want to be able to do. I'm going to be listening to small businesses to be able to do that. And I have a lot of support on all levels for small business development. It's a better tax base for, for the city because they pay five times more than, uh, than they do on the residential side, and they use 50% uh, of what the residential do in services as well. All right, thank you very much for the question. Uh, yes, Jeff, we'll get you at the end. Is Chris uh, Mason next? Yes, you're next. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, well, here, here's two things that I'd, I'd want to mention. We at Deep Growth, you know, we really believe in community democracy. You know, what the community wants is what it should be. If, if there's a really big store moving in, community should be uh, consulted. And if the community says, no, this is not what we want, it's gonna hurt our small businesses, it's not gonna benefit us, then it shouldn't be allowed, okay? Um, second thing I, I mentioned, and another, another um, you know, pillar of, of our platform is the idea of transition, okay? And transition means slow transition to self-sufficiency, okay, sustainability. Sustainability is one of these words that gets tossed around a lot, kind of like um, the word green with, with respect to Adrian. Um, it gets tossed around a lot, it's kind of lost some, some meaning, but the idea of transition is one to self-sufficiency, which means you're not relying on huge multinational corporations, you know, the, the, the big box stores, you know, the, the Starbucks that come in. And I think that uh, in addition to, to these great advisory councils that, that Alan's already mentioned, we can have an advisory council on transition. Um, because if you look at Europe, if you look at the UK, this is something that's already happening there. We had, there are towns there, small cities there that have declared independence from the international, uh, the, the global food market, okay? Um, and I think that uh, uh, if we take steps in that direction, it can only help small businesses and local businesses here. You know, it's just thinking globally that's gonna help locally. Thanks for the question. Okay, thank you. And Jeff, do you want to address as well? Yes, thanks, Ross. Well, everybody here will agree that small business is important, but I think everybody will also agree it's an extremely difficult and intractable question. You know, the west side of town has not had a ton of development, to be honest, and in Dunbar, for example, the population has been steady or slightly declined, so it wouldn't be surprising that small businesses would have trouble there unless they were extremely local in nature. And we can uh, freeze taxes, as we have for small business, through the tax shift. Cope and Division have a different position on that, but we, we, we feel that that tax shift, which has been quite hard on property owners who have not been pleased about it, should end at the agreed time in one year. It was a five-year <coughs> program, and then we should assess it. Then we get to the questions that uh, COPE and the NPA have raised about whether or not there should be a new class for small businesses, a new small business class, so that they're protected from the triple net leasing. 
it gets pretty complicated. But I think one of the things we really have to wrestle with is whether or not we can produce more business for those businesses in a positive way for, for communities, including uh, more investment in rapid transit. So it's a bit surprised to hear Adrian applaud uh, the concern about light rail. I think that the right kind of transit development along Broadway could be helpful. It's not going to come very quickly. But we certainly believe the future of the city does require rapid transit investment. That's one of Vision's fundamental principles. Uh, probably at least to Arbutus in the first stage, if we can get there, and then later to have a discussion about how to take it further. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is going to be for Elizabeth, Adrian, and Ellen. And I'd just like to remind candidates to hold the mic uh, close to your mouth, please. Okay, so with the current bad economic news looming, what can municipal people and government do on a community <coughs> level to help people on fixed income and seniors, i.e. groups, health groups like Kids Neighborhood House to facilitate to provide services for people? Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, so, the, I should, I'm sorry, can you just repeat the question one more time? Sure. With the current bad economic news looming, what can the municipal people and government do on a community level to help people on fixed incomes and seniors? Uh, in other words, help groups like Kids Neighborhood House to help facilitate to provide services for people. Well, I think that the uh, neighborhood organizations and uh, neighborhood houses like, like KIPP play a big role in, in helping people, especially those in, in lower income and, and who need assistance and who need special programs. And they should be the conduit to City Hall and in, in recommending what needs to be provided for their community and, and for individuals. But also, I think that there needs to be processes set up so that individuals don't get just lost in the system. Like, if you do try to uh, to bring something forward, it's often very hard for an individual to get heard by City Hall or to even work their way through the maze of who to talk to for specific issues. And that information has to get out and the best way to coordinate that is through a neighborhood-based process that, that allows people to access it directly in the community. Thank you. Thanks. Well, the first thing that uh, we need to handle is housing, um, and the second is of the, of the services. I mean, they kind of go hand in hand. Regarding housing, one of the things that uh, we've been supporting is, um, is trying to get a change in the federal tax laws to reinstate the incentives that uh, for developers to actually build affordable housing and to expand it to include maintain and upgrade affordable housing in the form of rental housing. We used to have fabulous investment in rental housing that went by the wayside when the tax laws were changed. I don't know anybody who hasn't opposed or who has opposed, um, but everybody who is supporting getting that back again. And then we could be maintaining, uh, building new and maintaining and upgrading older uh, rental housing instead of knocking it down. One of the purposes of that, we think, uh, would be to maintain some rental housing where seniors who have lived their lives in, in a particular neighborhood who don't want to leave and don't have any options for affordable housing in that area could be stay in the community that they've lived in and that they love and they're familiar with. Um, so housing one, in terms of neighborhood houses and, and services, I mean, number one, it's, it's really pathetic that in our constitution, cities only get eight cents on the tax dollar and the senior governments get more. So there is a need to bring that dollars, those dollars back at the community level. These are the hearts of our communities. Um, agreements should be sh for sure written with, with the, the community associations um, through the Parks Board to maintain those services. And Sandy Garasino has raised at virtually every debate the need to really aggressively pursue okay, a bigger then. share of the gambling here. money back into community services and nonprofits. Okay, thank you. Adrian. 
I, I think what Adrian was probably talking about, I'm not, I'm not quite clear, last comment, um, the casino money is a pre provincial jurisdiction, and obviously the, the, both the federal government and the provincial government are downloading services to municipal levels of government. In fact, if you look across Canada, there's an enormous, 100 and, I think it's $160 billion infrastructure deficit right now. And across this country, we're seeing more and more people homeless. There's the street homeless, but there's the couch surfing, uh, parents moving back in with their kids, kids moving in with their parents. There's all these uh, things happening right now, and we're the only G8 country without a national housing program. So the, the city staff has been working with us very hard over the past few years and has come up with a 10-year housing plan, which is a whole spectrum of needs of housing from low-income housing, shelters, rental housing, providing lands, and uh, I th would recommend you take a look at that program. It's certainly not enough. It's only $60 million, but actually housing is one area where there is enormous downloading. I mean, the, the provincial government tore down Little Mountain Housing, which housed 700 people in family housing. It was really critical, and nothing's happened on that site. I think we need rent banks so that people have, are tight with their income. Obviously, we funded this Kids Neighborhood House and the New Directions program, and we'll continue to work with you. But we have to stand together and uh, set up new and innovative programs like the CPAS that uh, Tim Lewis introduced, where transit is available to seniors of low income on top of the uh, safer pass. But there's many, many more okay, things we're working you. on. Thank you. Now, what concerns me is last week I read a huge article in the trade with uh, Tim Lewis's picture on the front page and three pages, and I read the three pages. And what concerned me is what he said about the neighborhood clinics. Now, talking about neighborhoods, we're all concerned about our neighborhoods. There is a city bylaw covering all the neighborhoods, and that is uh, an at-large system. Now, reading through this article about neighborhoods, no, which is very I, spicy, I, I came across, uh, in, uh, towards the end, he called it neighborhood clinics. Now, neighborhood clinics is another word for a word system. In my Eleanor, experience. could I ask you to... Uh, Mr. Moderator, I am here to t give information to these people, yes, this is a not question. to make a fancy political speech. Right, we're just asking now, you to ask your... people should know what, ask your question, what the neighborhood clinic is all about, and that is the board system. Now, if you want me to quit, I'll quit now, and I want you all to hear us that... What, he won't let me talk about something that's really going on in the city and that you no, should... No, I'm just asking you because it is a no, question. No, I have to quit. And answer, do you, you have a question? Do you have a but question? But remember, the neighborhood clinic, ask them about it because that's another word for the ward system. Okay. Is there a question with that? No. So, no. I want him to tell me whether it's true that he's really talking about the ward system. Okay, Tim, would you like to address that? I'm guilty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely guilty, and I plead guilty. But before I do that, let me thank you very much, Eleanor. You're a great addition to meetings. I remember you back when I was lucky enough to be on the park board for six years and you would come down and uh, talk to the board there and uh, the board would have the uh, same dilemma that the moderator today did. Great to see you there today. Not too close for the answer. Um, in, in terms of your neighborhood clinics, no, I was talking about neighborhood councils. And yes, that is a door opener to the W word, wards. And yes, I plead guilty. I am a big supporter of wards. Wards would give neighborhoods much more democracy, and wards would give neighborhoods a true say in decision making. In the I intro, error. I meant neighborhood, um, not clinics. 
council. But council. Right, so that right, was council. my error. Now you're you using up my time. Me. Thank you very much. Neighborhood council. I made a mistake. But that's and what the article is about. Neighborhood council. The demonstrator was upsetting me. Yeah, I've learned the hard way. Never interrupt Eleanor. Um, in terms of neighborhood council, here's my suggestion in a nutshell, if I may. I honestly believe that too many big ticket decisions are made at 12th and Canby by 11 more or less invisible people. And quite often, the big ticket decision is made around a neighborhood that isn't represented at all on council. So it's a big ticket decision to put in a multi-story apartment tower or to put in laneway housing or what have you. It's made at city council and not at the neighborhood level. I'd like to take those decisions out of the hands of the 11 council members and into the hands of a neighborhood council. My time is up. Thank you. Great. Uh, Sandy and then Ken. I would have an independent candidate, I would like to see a ward system. But uh, we do, we have, we've had a referendum on it. I think this is something that the citizens have to drive and, and have to decide, though I would support it. I, I want to take a, a brief moment to talk about your question about uh, small businesses and uh, again about affordability. One of the things that is straining small businesses, and my husband operates a small business and has many small business tenants, the tax issue is one aspect. Another aspect is that we have got uh, low disposable income, the housing affordability is squeezing middle class, like we can't believe. We have, what we're not realizing in this city is that we've got, uh, we're 20th out of 28 urban centers for median income, but our housing costs are twice, housing prices are twice the national average, and this is creating an, a huge squeeze. We are right here in Vancouver feeling um, this global structural dislocation that is killing the middle class and we have to be aggressive about protecting our middle class because that's the foundation of our democratic institutions, it's the foundation of our small medium businesses that uh, are the backbone of our economy, we're not a head office town, we're a small medium business town and we've got to really make sure that we protect those uh, businesses, that economy and our young people. I'd like to see taxation uh, I'd like to see unoccupied properties taxed at a business rate, just as one start. Uh, thank you. I'm going to deal with the, uh, the question around wards. I think that's a question that, that everyone wants to hear on there. Uh, we've been to many debates, and uh, I, I have to be honest, is that my natural inkling is to be able to go with wards. It would make my life easier as a politician, because I, I've had to travel probably more in the last 30 days as everyone here has than I have in the last 365 days. And there's a, there is a, a lot of difficulties with the at-large system. There is a lot of benefits as well because you tend to know the whole system. Uh, I was lucky enough to run into some people that participated in the Citizens' Assembly in relation to electronic, uh, electronic reform. And they, they, what they explained to me after a large discussion is they said, if we do go to a ward system, what you do is you you don't have the problems that you have now, but you have a whole new set of problems that are unforeseen from the involvement that they did. And those of you that are aware of that, these are people that were picked at random, where uh, they spent a year of their life going through this system to be able to come up with it. So in all the conversation that I've done and all the talk that I've heard, at, I'm looking for a bridge of the two, which means that you would go from an at-large system, possibly of five people, and then an actual uh, ward system of five, so you bridge the two of them and therefore you don't have a one creating all the difficulties of one system. Uh, that's what I'd like to be able to do on that. All right, thank you very much. Great, thank you. And excellent uh, question, Eleanor. Uh, the next uh, question, I see you had uh, Terry has joined us in lieu of Randy, so I'm gonna ask this of uh, four people so that Terry has a chance to uh, respond. So this is gonna be for Chris Shaw, Jeff, Ellen, and Terry. Uh, the question, uh, written question is, the past city council has made a lot of progress in terms of enlivening 
the local food options in the city from farmers markets to food carts. But what will you do to address the affordable factor, uh, especially in food desert areas? In other words, places where there may not be local grocery stores with an easy access to people. Uh, for instance, like South Granville, uh, we were we are being served by well served by high end gourmet stores and markets that deserve uh, affordable uh, food in the area. Well, this, this is a, an area that, that degrowth does think about, and it comes back to that whole transition notion, is how do you make your city as food secure as possible? And you look at cities like Boulder, places in England, and that Chris, Chris uh, Mason mentioned, and others, is they are going into a much more aggressive way of, of using the resources of the city, the land in the city. And, and Vision has, has touched on this, you know, with the chickens in the backyard, which is actually not that bad an idea in some ways. But that's only a, that's only a bandage step. There needs to be a lot more of this. Some people in the room look like they're old enough to remember the Victory Gardens of World War II. Those kinds of things that our grandparents did where they were much more self-sufficient in food is something we need to foster. We need to foster it with every way we can. We need to free up land in the city, and the city holds a lot of land, free up land across the city to make it more and more accessible for food uh, being raised by communities and by, uh, by different uh, co-op groups. Uh, we need to basically encourage people to do more of their own gardening, and we need to free up even maybe park space to make that happen. You look at like a city, a, a city like Hong Kong, this big metropolis, giant city, and yet they are food secure. With about they grow about seventy percent of their own food. Amazing. We are far less than that. I think we're in single digits. So we have a lot of options here, and some of it can come through tax incentives. Some of it can come through ways of the city actively promoting it, not just giving the little band-aid steps that we've seen so far. Well, thanks. And we have done everything we could to encourage the uh, production of food here. We do support the maintenance of the ALR, of course, which has its own consequences for how the city changes. And so some of the growth that can happen on the ALR is going to happen in the city of Vancouver. And that produces some of our debates about, uh, about development. But we've been very strong on, uh, on community gardens, backyard gardens, and all that kind of thing. The main new initiative that we've brought uh, forward is to work on a, a food hub for wholesalers to buy uh, food from local producers probably on the False Creek Flats, and make it more available for distribution to large suppliers. So we're, we've, the, the food market groups are very careful about making sure their development of the local farmers markets is done in a systematic way so that they don't fail and cause confusion because you've got to build up the uh, market as well as, as you build up the supply. But the hub will allow larger buyers for restaurants and even small grocery stores to have access to local food, and we think that's a practical step that will help uh, move this along. Actually, Alan is next. Thanks very much. I think this is a really important question, and obviously this council has really driven the green agenda and uh, are very, very committed to addressing climate change, and this is one key a aspect, especially in Vancouver, where we're so landlocked. Uh, thanks, Ross, for all the work that you've done in really keeping this front and center for all of us. Um, clearly, the food hub, a permanent place for a farmer's market where the, the Growers can bring their food, they can clean it, they can store it, and they can distribute it. We've expanded farmers markets to now five in the city. We're, we're funding all kinds of green initiatives. I'm a Strathcona community gardener. My partner is a green streets gardener. Um, we need to uh, continue the work that we've done in terms of development that encourages green roofs, uh, balcony gardening. Um, I think that, well, we already do have tax incentives uh, so that people can be in class seven when they're not actually using their site, so a lot of people say Burrard and Davy, that's a good example of how that's, that uh, chunk of land's been developed. Uh, there's a lot more we can do, and I think the, uh, whether it's the growing wheat, and I was able to go down to Strathcona Gardens where the, uh, I think it was 2,000 uh, pounds of wheat was gathered, and then it was hung in our rafters at the community gardens, and then kids used the bicycle to grind it, and then we made pizza and ate it. So it's just a way of engaging people, informing people, and leading into the future, a different type of future that makes this a green city. Well, our mayoral candidate, Randy Helton, alluded to this. Uh, 
what's happened in the past little while, and this is a 30-year plan that we won't be able to change without the approval of TransLink, without their consent, is the regional growth strategy. We used to have what was called the regional livability strategy. Now we have the regional growth strategy. Our, our governments are all about growth, densify, uh, uh, and that's what's causing a lot of our problems. The regional growth strategy actually weakens the protection of agricultural lands. Uh, under the regional livable strategy, livability strategy, they were pretty much sacrosanct. The regional growth strategy actually allows municipalities to move those boundaries and turn them into industrial lands. The next step is always residential. It's a drive to densify, um, and that's the biggest issue because as we lose our farmland, that is what really kills for uh, local food and, and people being able to produce it rather than buying it from uh, South America and the United States. So I think local initiatives are, are, are important, but the regional strategy is to weaken our ability to grow our own food. And I really encourage all of you to, to look that up on the internet. It's, been, it's gone under the table, almost no consultation on this. Um, we're really, really being hurt by this strategy and we need to do something about it. It's a 30-year plan. What I want to know is, um, do any of you or your party have any proposals or any ideas that will assist seniors in aging in place? Right now we're being hit with high property prices and high taxes, and we are being forced to abandon the only place we've known for all our lives. Thank you for that question. Um, Elizabeth Murphy with Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver. And I absolutely agree with the concept of, of having services in the community to keep seniors in their homes as long as possible. I had a, a very long and difficult experience with my mother who had been in her own home for, um, you know, right through into her 80s. But then as soon as she was having any kind of difficulties with just basic things, but she was still able to, to function in her home, it became almost impossible without uh, other support services coming in. And, and she did so much better when she was in her home than when she went into a, a care facility. One thing that really helped her uh, was the ASK program, which is like uh, the adult daycare program. And uh, she was able to go to that several times a week, and uh, they were just wonderful. But they're constantly getting their funding cut, and transportation to these programs is difficult. And I think that if they increase those kind of things, and actually through the neighborhood houses, that's a very good way to, to work these programs. Um, it is essential to, to keeping seniors with that kind of community access. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, actually it's right in the program, um, the, the platform of the Green Party. Um, first of all, it's really, I, mean, I have paid parents who are 87. They're still living in their own home. They both have medical issues. They would love to live in an apartment in the community that they love, where they have friends and they, and they know all the shopping and the senior center, um, they don't want a 400 square foot apartment. And so I think the challenge, um, or facility in, a, in another facility, the challenge is looking at number one, the needs of seniors, so social, uh, socially assisted housing options that have a range of sizes, it's extremely important, and a variety of neighborhoods, all of them throughout the, the city, not just a few here and there where if you want the right housing, you have to move into a different community. But I'm, I'm talking now about the principles that we have to, um, and the goals we have to, to aim at. A second is, um, it's not all about just uh, government support for assisted housing or our various forms of, 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 uh, of socially um, uh, subsidized housing, but getting the market, the, the, um, the, non, the market itself involved. And that was what I mentioned earlier. 
about tax incentives for the building of housing. There's zoning in the, in the range of four or six stories. If it's done around the neighborhood villages where shopping is local, where people are familiar with their services, in that kind of one level and size that is good for people, that especially seniors, it would, it would give them that option to stay in their community. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, you know, I can say that, that uh, my, my day job is as a customer service and, and billing rep for, um, for a, a cable company. And I hear every day from, from seniors who say, I, I, can't, I can't pay my bills, you know, I'm, I'm on pension. Um, it's something that, you know, I, I hear a lot. Anyhow, the, um, I think there's lots of options that, that we can look at. We can look at rent controls. Um, Adrian mentioned uh, a number of good options there. You know, if, we, um, if there's uh, in new developments, if there's a certain amount that are set aside for senior citizens, you know, and are uh, designed in such a way to meet the needs of, of senior citizens, I think community access is very important. Um, I would say that uh, we can go even farther than, um, you know, going back to the last question actually, go even farther with the city's involvement in uh, growing food. You know, we can provide community garden spaces, but that's dependent on, you know, the ability of the volunteer gardeners. If we have experts, you know, who can, who can plan permaculture designs, which are, um, uh, it, it's a way of growing that involves uh, low maintenance, high output, uh, these things can, can supplement people who are in need in the community, like seniors, like low-income people, like, um, like the, the sheltered homeless. Um, what happened here? And so uh, I think we can, go, we can go farther in rent controls and in food production. And I think, uh, again, everything that uh, Degrowth recommends for creating a sense of community is extremely relevant to this question. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question. Many of you talk about accountability and transparency. I'm wondering how you feel about the in-camera sessions that you will be asked to take part in uh, when elected to City Hall, and whether or not these sessions are compatible with the philosophy of transparency. And I'd like to have uh, Ken, Sandy, and Tim answer this question. Um, the in-camera sessions that are done at City Hall, if they're done in which, uh, the manner in which they were intended to do, which means that to pr protect the proprietary right and have open discussions with those that uh, are, are things that are happening within the city, uh, city e either individuals or actual companies, for example. Uh, I'll give you an example, and I'm just going to use my own example, is that if I wanted to go to the city and uh, and this doesn't fall under it, but I want to humanize it for you. If I was to go to the city and say, hey, listen, I'm a small arts and, and cultural type of business, and, and I'd be looking for some type of, uh, of relief in relation to the taxation increases coming forward, and they said, great, let's see your books. I think that's a reasonable thing for me to show it to them in camera so that it'd be private. And at the same time, I think it would be reasonable for me as a small business to not have to share that with everyone. Um, so then hopefully it jeopardize my business and they're both the same. So under that circumstances when it's very proprietary information, yes, but I don't think that it should be used in relation to hiding information from the citizens. So how you protect that is you have a, a strong independent information officer that's allowed to be able to look at that and compare it to the legislation so that if it doesn't follow those very narrow guidelines, it is released and it's not a way to hide information. Thank you very much. That was my answer. <laughs> We've realized a lot of things, I'm not surprised. Yes, I, I think that generally speaking, what we're really talking about here is trust in the integrity of the system. And the, the, the sense that in camera sessions, uh, that there's something secret going on, it, that's, the, that's the thing that we really want to be careful of. But Ken has put his finger exactly on, on the reason why occasionally. Um, there is a necessity for private discussions because sensitive issues come up. Having said that, have, in, in my dealings with the casino issue, I can tell you that the, the public disclosure and the, and the community consultation and the openness was just, we just weren't getting it in the sense that, uh, just to give you an example, 
the public notice of uh, that this development was going on was was put on postcards, you know, this size, and mailed out to residents within two city blocks of BC Place Stadium. That's the that's the kind of um, public consultation and, and notice that there was, apart from signs going up and the little notices in the newspaper, which nobody reads. So it's no, it's about real public engagement, and it's and uh, so my philosophy is open, transparent, accountable, but there has there does have to be a systemic respect for confidential information uh, and and judgment. But the fundamental, the baseline issue is. Does the public have confidence and trust in the system? And that's bit, that's missing right now. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Yeah. I will try real hard to do the impossible. Answer two questions in a minute and a half. In camera meetings happen too frequently. They should only happen if it's an item that must go in camera. If we're bidding on something. Obviously, that's going to go in camera. If it wasn't, folks bidding against us would have an unfair advantage. But the mere fact that the item is sensitive probably means it shouldn't be in camera. The fact that it's sensitive may mean that city council is uncomfortable with it being out in the open and it should be out in the open. But let me move very quickly to the last question, seniors aging in their own neighborhood. Number one, we need to make certain that seniors are aware of the fact that they're legally allowed to stop paying their property taxes. If not all seniors are comfortable doing that because it does accrue and it's going to get paid when they sell their house, but that is an option. Number two, I'd like to see the Property Endowment Fund explore the possibility of offering very small loans to seniors on that same basis. If the house is in need of repair, they should, it's a crime that they can't afford the repair, got to move into a facility. Why doesn't the Property Endowment Fund do the same thing that the city does on property taxes? lend a modest amount, and it would accrue, interest would accrue, but no payments until it's sold. Number three, let's make certain that neighborhood houses, community centers, and the libraries, the living rooms of communities, are used to provide services to seniors. And last but not least, why aren't we connecting students with seniors so that if a student wants to use seniors' backyard to grow vegetables, and they share it at the end of their season, the senior benefits and the student benefits. Okay, Tim. I've run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're uh, almost out of time. We're going to try and squeeze in uh, one, maybe two more questions. We're going to go slightly over. So, Julian, you have questions? Yeah, we've got two questions on the floor. Here's the first. My name is Eva Madonna, and I have a question uh, related to if you are elected, how are you going to balance the issues pertaining to the smallest possible units like neighborhoods? versus the city needs and Metro Vancouver uh, complex. The reason I'm bringing it up is I live, I live in Ipitalano, but there are issues which go way beyond neighborhood, and climate change is one of those, need for transportation or sustainability is another one. And if possible, I would like to hear from already elected officials at the city level, or from those who are aspiring to be elected officials. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're actually going to have more questions that we have time for, but there will be time to socialize after we've been asked uh, some of the candidates. So uh, let's just see where we are in the rotation. So uh, for this one, uh, we're going to have uh, Chris Shaw, Jeff, Terry, and and you wanted to answer this question? Sure. Okay, so we'll have you go for it. Well, I, I thank you for that question because this fits very well with what I started my opening remarks with and our, our key principle of our, of our party. We have a different view of what government is and how government serves the public. We, you know, I, I guess some people throw the term at us that we're populist as if it's a bad thing. We're not. I don't think it's a bad thing. We believe that democracy really has to start at the bottom. Okay. The role of government, in my view, growth is not to force things downward, that one size fits all, and you're going to take it or lump it, and you get to consult every, every now and then, and then they ignore you, and or you vote every three years, and then they, they vote for what they wanted and not what you want. But rather that communities have to make their own decisions. 
And the goal is, and then it does raise the very interesting point that you raised, how do you adjudicate between competing interests across communities? Because they're not all going to want the same thing. So in my world, the way I see it, government is served to facilitate and adjudicate and mediate and to find that consensus model, again, as you're seeing people do down in Occupy Vancouver, as, as complex as that is, so that different communities can get something that they want for themselves and yet live with their neighbors. It's, it's a different way of looking at dem democratic governance, and yet it can be done, and it's done in various places. For example, very fast uh, example of what happens in Porto Alegre, Brazil. How do they raise their budget? It comes from the dinner table, works its way up to the neighborhood, all the way up to the city council, where someone like you stands in front of city council, where everybody in the city has been consulted in principle, and you say, here's your budget, here's how you're going to spend it. Well, it's a great question, and it goes to the crux of what the election is really about, because it seems to me that you can't have a sustainable society without strong and vibrant neighborhoods, but each neighborhood has to do its part for the sustainability of the whole city. I'll use two examples right here in Kits, because we had two tough rezonings, and they were rezonings, you know, where the community wasn't unanimous at all about, uh, about uh, the development at, at 8th and Vine, where social housing was converted, and the issue was, would we be able to integrate into the neighborhood a larger development that was outside the plan to a degree we would bring on board a number of very, very precious disability suites at an affordable price. I mean, we only got one opportunity to approve disability suites of that quality in the entire three years I was at council. I hope we get more, but it wasn't unanimous in this community that that should be the case. There's gonna be a senior center there too. I walked by it this morning, I thought it looked pretty good. Here as well, heritage development, seniors and that kind of thing are all ways that this neighborhood, through rezoning and through careful development and a lot of debate, is contributing to the overall sustainability of the, of the region, but getting benefits here too. So uh, this neighborhood has fantastic community leadership. It doesn't always agree. And that's the tough part of councils, making sure we listen and try to find the right balance that will work for the region and for the community at the same time. Great question. How do we how do we deal with competing interests when when it's when we talk about neighborhoods or the city as a whole? Um, first of all, I'd like to say that neighborhoods for a sustainable Vancouver want to bring back real democracy to our city. What we've seen in the past six years is the decisions being made by people in city hall that have majorities that are listening to only one group of people, and that's the development community. Uh, we want to put an end to that. We want neighborhoods to have a say in what happens in their neighborhood. And when it's a competing interest, when it's a city-wide issue, we want to be able to consult with all of the neighborhoods in the city and come to some kind of consensus to work with people, not have an us and them kind of relationship, but a we relationship where we, we all work things out together. And, and we can easily do that. We have neighborhoods who were asked questions, how do you see densification occurring in your neighborhood? The neighborhoods didn't say, we don't want the densification. They said, this is how it's palatable to us. This is how we can accommodate that. So I don't see a, a system where we, have, um, where we have a city hall that's working against people. Like Occupy Vancouver is a really good example. You know, what, what happened there? We had Susan Anton on the day one saying, kick them out. We had Gregor burying his head in the sand and hoping it would just kind of work out and go away. Nobody went down there to work with people. And when we do that, when we, neg we negotiate, when we respect everybody's uh, uh, opinions and work with people, we come to solutions. Vancouver's a place where solutions happen. Uh, we started the, the Blue Box program worldwide. That started in Vancouver. We started Greenpeace. Uh, we started the Occupy Wall Street movement. We have a, a lot of ingenuity in our city, and I think as we work together with people, rather than have 11 people at City Hall making decisions with, with a uh, development community in the back room, uh, it's counterproductive. So that's what we're about. Uh, thank you. I'm going to make a couple quick statements about, about uh, the Occupy Vancouver really quickly here. Susan Anton's been very clear from the beginning on it. Uh, protest is allowed, decamp and defense or not. 
I can also uh, let you know that she has been down to Occupy Vancouver, I have been down to Occupy Vancouver a number of times, and as strange as this following statement is going to be, it is true, a number of people from Occupy Vancouver are in support of me as an NPA. Thank you. Uh, so I've been down there and I've engaged with them. Susan Anton's tried to be, or she, Susan Anton has be, been clear the encampment part. Now I'm going to segue in what we can be able to do with neighborhoods. I'm in uh, contact uh, previous to the election and now with Heritage Vancouver, dealing with them on issues that they want to deal with. And I've been talking about them. And some of the things that I look at is we designate individual places, buildings of heritage. I think that we should start looking at neighborhoods as heritage. It isn't necessarily that we have to take on this growth. I've been to large multinational cities just outside of New York. You have nice bedroom communities that don't have high rises. I've been all through Europe that have a way more population than we do, and some communities don't have that. We don't have to do that. What we need is a strong, uh, a strong leadership in, in the GBR, in, in the boards throughout the region, so that we can be able to make those people in the regions put more people into their areas. That's better for the environment if we have people along in Metro Town, if we have people out in Coquitlam that, that they build a, affordable housing out in that area. That will take pressure off us if we don't keep on bringing in people that's sustainable. Thank you. Thanks, I'm sorry I didn't say that. Thank you very much. Okay, and sorry for the confusion on that order and the last question. Um, we received a number of other questions. What we're going to do is we're going to go a little longer on the questions, try and get as many questions in as we possibly can. Uh, when we've absolutely run out of time, I will actually ask all the other questions, and then during the time we have allocated to mingle with candidates, you may want to ask individual uh, candidates your, your questions. So the next question is going to be for Ellen, Adrian, and Jeff. And the question is, uh, this neighborhood has been taken over by the patrons of Lola's Pub at Broadway and Vine. Which of the candidates will do something to restore our peace? Weekly, we put up the screaming kids from this liquor primary establishment, and weekly, we deal with fights, urinating in our alleys and streets, damaged vehicles, and <coughs> doors. So that's Ellen, and Adrian, and Jeff. Um, certainly, this did come before us, and uh, I, I didn't think that we needed more seats in the area, and I know that there are many people came from uh, this neighborhood coming to talk to us um, and what we heard from the police is that they have a car there almost every day and we do have good neighbor agreements. Um, I didn't know this was continuing to be a problem because I knew it was a problem when it first came before us. So I promised to take this back to staff next week when I go get back in and raise this with staff and say that we have to immediately meet with the owners and find out why they're not uh, complying with that agreement and enforce it because it's not appropriate that the people in the neighborhood are having so much traffic, so much noise, litter, and uh, urination. That's appalling. And uh, the owners have to be responsible for that. Um, can, can I also say that I've, I've, I've been a great Occupy supporter. I think everybody knows that. I was the first elected official and I think the only one to speak down there, but our staff have been working there every single day and I promised to be there at noon today because they're having a housing march. So I, I really would like to go there. So if there's any pressing questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but I really would like to be down there by noon. Well, the Regal Eagle was the application that came to council, which is right next door to Lola's. There was so much confusion about where the problems were coming from that the Regal Beagle application was sent back for another review that's going to take uh, some months, I think, to see what is the problem there. Is it Lola's? Is it the Regal Beagle or both? And what recommendations will staff bring forward in terms of the Regal Beagle? So we are going to need to hear more from the community on that because there was uh, a number of people who were in the community who said, we like the Regal Beagle application. It's not the issue. Others who said, uh, the issue, there is an issue, it's Lola's, and frankly, sitting at council, it's very hard to sort it through. So please uh, participate in that process, because if you don't want any expansion, Lola's has already got its seats, the Regal Beagle wanted more. Uh, to go back and take away Lola's seats would be a big struggle, but it's, well, if the community wants to engage in it, certainly I'll be there to respond. Thank you. 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 I'm hesitant to respond on an issue in which I'm not fully informed, and I think it's important to be fully informed. So first of all, um, in the question period or the meet and greet afterwards, if 
people who are involved in this issue could talk to me, that would be great. I can sit down and get informed. But um, is, are, are one of these late night openings tough, or are they just regular? Is there a late night opening? Well, this is a, a nightclub. Yeah, but is it, how, is it one of the ones whose hours was extended? Uh, it's until 2 o'clock. Until 2 o'clock. Okay, it's not extended. Because one thing I have heard about, I, I've, um, I'm going out into a, uh, in, in a police cruiser, um, so the gentleman who's going to be taking me off, he, um, he was letting me know, so I'm going to do it all night and just get a feel for some of the issues. But right off the bat, he said to me, there is a, a real problem with some of the late at night openings um, in that the openings extend hours in establishments beyond the other municipalities, municipalities around Vancouver. So when those pubs close, people just come in on the SkyTrain or whatever and end up in Vancouver for the last few hours. They're already drunk when they arrive and it's a real mess. So I think it needs to be looked at. I'm just, I would like to sit down and talk to people more about it because community, noise bylaws, you know, safety, integrity of the, of the community are paramount for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we're going to take uh, two more questions from the floor. Oh, hi, I'm Stephen Farley. Um, it's interesting that the last civic election, we had a 31% turnout to vote, which is pretty pathetic. And I believe Randy prefaced his remarks today by showing a graph of the funding for the political parties in the civic election. And I think one of the problems is that people don't feel that they are going to make any difference in a civic election. Um, in addition, the funding of the political parties, we don't get a tax credit on the federal income tax form for supporting civic parties. But what I would like to hear from you is what actions are you going to take to change this? Because I would like to contribute more to the civic election, but unless I get a tax credit for it, they'll go to federal parties. Okay, so this question is for Sandy, Tim, Chris, M, and Terry. I'd like to believe that I can change uh, tax policy on on uh, on. Of political donations, I, it's doubtful that I can. Uh, I do think that uh, it's it's at the upper end that we really want to be looking at. So when we've got two major parties that are throwing two and a half million dollars at each other for a total of almost five million dollars, it really does create a, an enormous barrier for uh, less capitalized organizations or individual candidates. So actually, I would really put this to the voters and put the onus, it's, it's you that can make a difference. It's you that can put, that can diversify the voices inside council and open things up for candidates like Adrian, like me, for NSV. Uh, and the, it's the larger donation, that's where the issue is. And, and there's no question that the larger donations are very much driven by corporations that have interests in the outcomes of council, in, of council um, deliberations. And I think that that presents a clear conflict of interest. And I know that people are good people, they're doing their best, but there's no doubt about it that money talks and when the development community is supporting both the major political parties, we've got a problem. It's the voters that have the answer. Actually, Chris, Chris, Chris Shaw. Chris Shaw? Or actually, let's see. I'm sorry, I did say Chris Sam. Yeah. Sorry. All right, thanks. Um, first of all, uh, Stephen, right? You said you're a social science teacher at, uh, at, in high school. I think in terms of like your contribution to, to the municipal election, I think you're probably contributing more than anyone to you know, the, the long-term health of democracy by being um, uh, you know, a, a civically engaged individual in contact with youth. Okay, I don't doubt that you're passing that along to your students. I think that that is probably the most important thing that any of us can do is talk to our kids about what's going on, even if they're not 18. Because once you're 18, it's too late to start caring. Well, it's not too late to start caring, but... Yeah, I support that. 
you know, if that's if that's something that the, the community wants, I you know I definitely support debate on that. Um, I, I don't know the, you know both sides of, of that particular suggestion, um, but here's one thing that that I think that uh, council can do, individual councillors can do, and council as a whole can do to to foster this mentality that I'm talking about, uh, not just for youth but for everyone in the community to raise that 31 percent is have events. Um, sort of like this, but on another topic, you know, that are housed within community houses, um, which are a great venue, um, on topics that concern the community. You know, maybe it's, uh, it's practical things. Maybe it's a workshop on gardening. Maybe, you know, home canning. You know, so something that, that, that people that wouldn't normally come out, come out to. And council is actually there, participating, interacting with people on something that's not directly uh, voting, and then afterwards, okay, thank you. there's time for a discussion. There you go. Uh, let's have Tim and then Terry. Tim and then Terry. All right, well, when parties spend literally millions of dollars on an election campaign, it becomes this, a contest to see which party is best at purchasing the outcome of the election. And that's very sad. If you're really opposed as a party to developers funding your party, you don't wait for the provincial government to change the rules. You simply say no. COPE has a long history. We don't take donations from developers. We don't take them waiting for the provincial government to say developers cannot fund municipal parties. In the long run, that's a great solution. I'm not sure if I'll live to see it, but it'd be a great solution. In the meantime, not just I personally, but my party as a whole takes absolutely no donations from developers. What I'd like to see, of course, is the provincial government do what the federal government does, fund, uh, fund municipal parties based on the number of votes that they get. That's very democratic. That's what's done at the federal level. That's what we should be doing at the municipal level. But until we do that, how about a friendly challenge to all of the other parties on the scene today? Will your party agree, effective today, to turning down any offers of any donations from developers and follow COPE's 40-year history of doing that? Campaign finance. The biggest problem we have uh, is campaign finance. Great example is the Wall Court development at Kingsway and, and Boundary uh, a week ago, where they allowed uh, on a zone site 300 units to go to 1,114 units. Vision and the NPA were spending campaign funds from Wall Corp at that very moment when they voted to allow them those extra 800 units without one single affordable ho rental housing unit. Uh, is that corruption? In my view, it is. Even if it isn't, it's the appearance of corruption. That has to stop. Uh, Vision's excuse is, well, the NPA gets the money, so we have to get it to compete. Well, we at Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver don't need the, the provincial government to tell us what the right thing to do is. We don't take money from corporations. We don't even take it from unions because we think there's a conflict there because the city negotiates contracts with unions. We don't want a conflict of interest. Um, this is such a key matter in our, in, our, in our city. The other part of your question was, how do we get people out to vote? We only have 30%. I be strongly believe that as we empower communities to make decisions that affect them and take some of the power out of City Hall and put it in the hands of communities, people will be a lot more engaged in what's going on in their city and a lot more people will vote because they're going to be a part of the process. And so that's what, what part of our platform is, is to take that power, put it in neighborhoods, and get people engaged in politics so that more people will vote. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is uh, what's predominantly for uh, Jeff Meggs, but Tim could also uh, answer this as well. Um, and it refers to the Slate uh, Vision Party, referring to um, the greenest city is one of the, the top two priorities. Well, if that's the case, I'm curious why you haven't chosen to endorse the Green Party in a green car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, 
Well, I've been surprised at some of Adrian's positions. First of all, we, we were in discussions with the Green Party and they didn't work out. Uh, why is Adrian Carr not endorsing Gregor Robertson is an equally valid question. But, you know, we, we have not advocated as the Green Party did bike free streets and Adrian's explained all that. Um, I've been surprised at her reactions on a number of points. But we have a very strong program with Andrea Reimer who's been involved in the Green Party for many years, is now uh, a councillor at Vision Vancouver and a huge consultation citywide with uh, 35,000 people to create the Grid City Action Plan. We hold it up with pride uh, around the world. And uh, so we do feel we've got a very strong green platform and that uh, people who support environmental values should support that platform. At the risk of, uh, of appearing to avoid the question, let me tell you this, and I say this with all sincerity, uh, with no humor. COPE is a very, very, Democratic Party, I follow the membership rather than the other way around, the membership following the so-called leaders. The membership voted democratically and transparently at the end of a lengthy debate to go the route that we've gone. Once the membership have spoken, that brings the debate to an end. I know I'm not going to reopen that debate. So I support what the members did because the membership are always right. The membership voted to enter into a cooperative campaign with vision. Uh, that having been said, COPE on many occasions in the past has entered into cooperative campaign agreements with the Green Party. And we've, uh, we've read a long history of doing that and overlap in terms of our philosophy and our, uh, our ideas between the uh, COPE and the Green Party. So I, I can't comment on the first part of your question other than to say you've got to ask the membership. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Elizabeth and Kenneth if I ask anything, and then since this question is about Adrian, I'll allow her to uh, end. Elizabeth, do you want to uh, respond? Uh, yes, I would just like to say that Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver, NSB, have actually recommended our that voters vote for the Green Party and, and Adrian Carr, and uh, we are very supportive of her, and I, I think that it is um, very important that, that people do look at a, a, a varied slate this time, and Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver are, are running a, a mayoralty candidate and four councillors, including myself and Terry Martin that's here, and, and also Marie Kirchham and Nicole Benson, which is not here. But uh, we, we have endorsed a, a, a number of candidates, including Adrian, and we really want to see some diversity and, and um, certainly the, the green um, platform is consistent with what we have put forward and Adrian has uh, confirmed that as well. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, Ken Charco, I'm from the NPA. I think the question is why am I not endorsing Adrian Carr? It's pretty simple. We're running 10 council candidates, and uh, there isn't room on council for Adrian Carr under that scenario. I support all my council candidates. I think they do really good, but I do want to end up with this. I've uh, been campaigning with Adrian Carr for a number of, uh, of these debates. I've seen her for a long time, and I would be pleased uh, if she was to be on the board. And, delighted to work with her. I am. I can fundamentally say that my thought process at the beginning of this, which has been a six month process, has uh, somewhat been changed and enlightened in the fact that uh, I'm so amazed on how many pro-business stances that Adrian Carr holds that I as well equally support. And I'm sure if uh, Adrian was to get onto council that we'd work fine together. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank goodness it didn't go on. It would be getting embarrassing. <laughs> uh, um, first of all, uh, just to be clear about the process, the, the Green Party of Vancouver uh, did vote back in February 
uh, unanimously amongst its members to run a slight minimum of one, one, and one. One for council, one for school board, one for park board. Um, and I wasn't part of the negotiating team, but our negotiating team did sit down with the, with the vision and co-negotiating teams because there was an accommodation last time, made it clear what the members wanted, and the response back was, no, we're only going to leave open one spot on park board. Um, so to abide by our members' wishes, um, we didn't form uh, uh, any kind of accommodation with uh, Hope and Vision this time around. And I'm pleased to be standing um, as a Green Party candidate with two other Green Party candidates, one for each board. I think each of our voices would be extremely important. Um, we do bring a different perspective. Um, I have noticed that Jeff Meg several times has mentioned in this meeting, I'm surprised at Adrian saying, so let me be clear, the notion of bike-free streets, which bike-free was a very poor use of word, uh, <laughs> use of terms, and I regret using it in the sense that it got miscued, but I sat down with people in the bicycling community and made it, um, and cl helped clarify that. And the clarification is this, the idea arose out of, in fact, um, talking to bus drivers about how to get transit moving better. And getting transit moving better meant bike-free lanes. Certain bus lanes like Broadway and, uh, and Hastings, which would, in fact, eat, just move, it, move the buses so much more quickly, like they did in the Olympics. Okay, and they said clearly, no bikes, no taxis, no cars in those lanes. That's a solution. And that can precede LRT. It certainly re would replace yeah, in, the, right, right, in, the, in the Broadway thank corridor, you. much more efficient and less costly. <laughs> okay, thank you. So uh, this concludes the portion of the uh, meeting where candidates will be able to answer. Okay. We're, we're going to yes, we're going to read out the questions that we don't have time for candidates to answer. Then, so, so what I was about to say is, uh, while we won't have candidates uh, sitting here and answering the additional questions we have, I will read those questions, and you're free to uh, engage with the candidates. We will go to 12:30, uh, so there'll be plenty of time to ask the candidates. So, the, the, the questions that we're unfortunately not going to get to are I would like a discussion of what each candidate wants to do with regard to the Broadway Transit Corridor. It will have a tremendous impact on our community. The next question is Is there any way to bring in a bylaw that will keep seniors' homes in a different tax bracket? And then there was a comment that this is not about seniors' amenities. The third question was I've been living in kits for almost two years now and have some difficult finding gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered groups to be part of. Would you have plans to create or support a, an inclusive community group such as this for social and support purposes, especially for young people? Uh, this was a question specifically addressed to Ellen and Jeff. How far should the city go to removing Occupy Vancouver? Are riot squads too far? Uh, next question was, uh, what role do you see neighborhoods uh, playing in, a municipal, in municipal governance? And then there were several questions from the business community, including do you support the good governance concept to keep tax increases and spending within our means? Do you support the good governance concept to build our quality of life and save for the future? And do you support the good governance concept to actively communicate municipal business in a clear and understandable fashion? So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Julian, and he's going to make some concluding remarks. Well, first of all, I think it's important to thank all of our uh, city uh, candidates that came out this morning. So thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of healthy debates, and uh, you know, had uh, great questions from both uh, our uh, submitted questions and the floor. And uh, we, as, again, as mentioned, had a few questions lingering around, so do uh, definitely uh, approach your candidates and uh, bring those uh, topics up to them. Uh, Catherine, also uh, a wonderful work on behalf of the Kitts Neighborhood House of putting this forum together on such a <laughs> And of course, the uh, difficult uh, job of moderation. Uh, it can be challenging at times, but great work uh, for us on that one. So, uh, Uh, we, of course, uh, support a, a lot of the business uh, aspects.
aspects of, of what goes on in this, the community as well. And, but it's also important to know uh, the individual and, and those important individual uh, and community issues that go on as well. So it's great that we have this forum to do so. So again, great round of applause. Thank you. And I think now we'll break to... Uh,